The story starts in a time that seems so far away that it blends into myth. Peace and quiet filled the land. The calm people didn't know it, but there was a dark shadow on the horizon. The Demon King, a terrifying being with unimaginable power, attacked with his huge army, upsetting the peace of that day. People prayed in secret for a change from the old stories because they wanted a new finish to the cycle they had seen over and over again. In the middle of the chaos, a legendary figure appeared. A mysterious hero, shining with holy light, stood on top of a scary monument of dead enemies. He was wearing holy clothes and holding a sword that came from heaven, as if he had seen this coming. He took a determined leap into what was meant to be the final fight between good and evil, between the hero and the demon king. As soon as their swords touched, the sky lit up in a beautiful blaze that bathed the world below. The hero defeated the Demon King in a heroic act that would be remembered for all time. The Demon King then went into the earth and fell asleep, but his sleep was short. So the cliché came true again. There was peace in the world, and the hero's story became a legend. Time moved the world forward like a river, taking us to a time very different from the days of prophecy. In the present, there was a disturbance in the dark halls of the underground. A smaller demon walked nervously up to the throne and told the Lord of Darkness, Demiorgos, the 666th, about a major problem. The Demon King, who was wearing battle-worn armor, asked what was going on. The devil, who was shaking, showed a piece of paper with strange and surprising writing on it. I stopped being a Dark Lord. Don't look for me, you stupid people, it said. It was Demiorgos's sudden departure and he was known for being very rebellious. After hearing those words, the royal fiend was confused. The real demon king, on the other hand, found comfort in a place that wasn't like his own, a bright white castle that was bathed in sunlight. As he looked at the grandeur of Arcoma Castle in the Verde Kingdom, he thought about the human realm he had heard about. He thought about what to do next in a world that was both strangely appealing and unfamiliar. The disguised Demon King stopped dancing and partying carelessly when he looked up and saw the Holy Cross on top of a nearby church. His eyes briefly hardened as he saw it, but he quickly turned his attention away when someone called out to him. Someone asked, Hey, Country Bumpkin, where did you come from? It took a moment to understand where the question was coming from, the Demon King. They stood there for two nights, giving off an air of power and suspicion. They questioned him about having the nerve to walk around so openly in front of the grand castle of Arcoma. His face lit up with confusion as he thought about the insult, Country Bumpkin. Could it be the way he dressed that got him that name? He told himself that his face was perfect. With a mix of anger and what seemed like fear hiding his confidence, the knights called him names and accused him of loitering. The Demon King, who was pleased by himself, knew he couldn't say that his real name was Demiorgus the 666th. Me, he said, pretending not to know, while in his mind he made up a safe nickname. He chose the name Deus because, in his opinion, it was simple enough while still evoking a sense of old power. Just as he introduced himself, another figure approached, a knight adorned in golden armor, followed by four soldiers. This was Count Bruo, a man whose regality was evident in his stance. Count Bruo, upon hearing the name Amdeus, warned the stranger of the weight such a claim carried in the Verde Kingdom, offering a chance for forgiveness should the Demon King depart forthwith. The disguised ruler, Deus, inquired provocatively about the kingdom's strength and whether it was formidable enough to accept him as its king. Count Bruo, incensed by the insolence and perceived mockery of the royal lineage, unsheathed his sword, threatening the stranger's life. Yet in a flash of terrifying power from Deus's eyes, the inevitable happened. Count Bruo's head erupted in a gruesome spectacle. As the soldiers turned in disbelief, their fates mirrored their fallen leaders, their heads detonating in a cascade of horror, leaving the question, Sir Bruo, hanging unanswered in the blood-stained air. Deus hummed a song and smiled, but his laid-back attitude belied the bloody scene that was happening. The remaining five soldiers, their minds reeling from the inconceivable display of power,
found no time to process their shock as their heads met the same explosive fate as their leaders. The melody continued, a deadly lullaby, and with each note, the heads of the soldiers burst as if in time with the grim rhythm. High atop the castle walls, the archers, gripped by urgency, knocked their arrows and let loose a volley aimed at the sinister figure below. Yet, as the arrows neared, they disintegrated, consumed by a dark purple magic that shielded Deus. With another glance, a mere glare from the ominous being, the archers met the same gruesome end as their comrades below. It was then that Deus uttered a word known to every mother, every reader, a word that resonated with an eerie power. Arise. As if bound by his command, the slain soldiers, now devoid of their heads, were compelled to form a grotesque display, their bodies arranged in a cross formation, face down. Blood cascaded from their necks, a gruesome tribute to the one they were now forced to acknowledge as their new king. Deus's invocation turned the scene into a perverse coronation. The bodies lurched forward, leaving a slick crimson trail across the bridge, a testament to the horror that had occurred. Alarm spread among the remaining forces as they called for reinforcements, their voices tinged with panic. Confusion reigned as they grappled with the notion of an invasion, their comrades outside lifeless, the enemy already within their walls. The soldiers, armaments in hand, could scarcely believe the carnage before them. Fear clenched their hearts as the castle doors creaked open, only to be violently shattered from their hinges. Deus, now levitating with an eerie grace, wore a smile that heralded further doom. He invited them to turn their screams into fanfares for his arrival. Their screams were short-lived, however, as a horde of spectral skulls poured through the breached gate. The relentless wave of the undead showed no mercy, tearing through the ranks of soldiers with a relentless ferocity, leaving behind a scene of unbridled devastation. The soldiers, overwhelmed by fear, pleaded for salvation, their cries piercing the tumultuous scene. But no mercy came. Instead, they were torn asunder, their heads cleaved from their bodies, their flesh rendered by the relentless forces of undead sorcery. Madness, chaos, and agony reigned as the once mighty warriors were reduced to mere fragments of their former selves. Amidst this carnage, some soldiers found themselves praying for a swift end to their torment, yearning for the release of death to liberate them from the unbearable pain. At the center of this maelstrom stood Deus, his face a serene canvas adorned with a peaceful smile that glinted amidst the horror. At that moment, a voice spoke out of faith, cutting through the screams and the sound of flesh being torn apart. A knight, adorned in golden armor and wielding a holy sword, knelt in prayer amidst the chaos. His chant was a beacon of hope, invoking the name of the Almighty Creator, beseeching guidance from the Eternal Master to steer them from darkness and into the light of truth, to emerge victorious against the shadow that enveloped them. This pious warrior, bathed in a celestial glow, continued his supplication, calling upon the divine to overcome death and deceit. As he drew his sacred blade, a surge of holy radiance emanated from his being, casting a beam of purifying light into the heavens. The assembled soldiers, witnessing this display, wondered if this was the fabled aura, the blood of the virtuous they had only heard tales of. With holy symbols emblazoned upon his visage, the knight declared his ignorance of Deus's identity, but recognized the taint of dark magic. Ready to unleash his divine retribution, the knight affirmed that no matter the foe's might, he would not breach the defenses of the castle, nor overcome one blessed by the gods. Propelled by faith, he leapt into the air, a herald of the divine, and with a mighty cry declared his intent to vanquish the darkness. His sword, now an extension of his righteous will, descended with a force that cleaved through the air, igniting the ground with an explosion of sacred light. The impact shattered the very bedrock, scattering holy illumination far and wide, inflicting vast devastation upon the land and challenging the dark presence of Deus with the unyielding might of the holy. Looking upwards, the golden-clad knight believed his mighty blow had secured victory over the dark entity before him. To his dismay, a voice shattered his moment of triumph. Deus, unaffected, trivialized the knight's attack as nothing more than a trifling effort. 
To the knight's horror, Deus was effortlessly pinching the very tip of the holy sword between his fingers, questioning if it was now his turn to strike. With a mocking prayer, Deus sarcastically said the Lord's Prayer only to abruptly dismiss the plea and say, God please kill this idiot, to then demonstrating a chilling display of power. Before the knight could react, Deus had carved a gaping chasm within him, effortlessly shattering the holy sword and plucking the still beating heart from the knight's chest. With a gaze that could freeze blood, Deus admonished the knight for daring to invoke the divine and with a merciless squeeze ended the knight's life, his heart bursting into oblivion. Deus then addressed the remaining knights who had formed a protective circle around their king. The knights, desperate and defiant, urged one another to stand firm for the final stand, to guard their sovereign with their lives. The king, caught amidst the turmoil, questioned the identity of the intruder. Deus approached with a casual stride, seemingly intrigued by the king's presence, and suggested a conversation. As a knight rebuked Deus for his insolence, a mere flick of Deus's finger was enough to detonate the heads of the outspoken knights, silencing them mid-cry. The remaining knights, consumed by a mix of anger and helplessness, found themselves speechless, knowing any objection might lead to their immediate demise. Seizing the deafening silence, Deus unfurled demonic wings and soared over the knights' heads, landing with imposing grace upon the king. With the sovereign now beneath him, Deus looked down, a predator regarding his cornered prey. It was impossible to ignore the stress because the king's life was in such danger. With a sarcastic laugh, Deus suggested that they start talking. The elderly king, trembling with fear for his life, hastily offered whatever Deus might desire. Wealth, titles, anything within his royal capacity. Deus, with a smirk, had but a single demand, the surrender of the kingdom itself. The king protested, claiming such a request was impossible to which Deus responded dismissively, suggesting death as an alternative. If the king were to die, Deus reasoned, the royal lineage would naturally fall to him. When the king realized what this meant, he began to fully crash out. He accused Deus of wanting his daughter. He cried out in fear, his tears and snot streaming down his face. But Deus was indifferent to the king's assumptions. He had no interest in the princess. He was unaware of her existence. The king, desperate to protect his daughter, proclaimed her the pride of their nation, the jewel of the royal family. Yet Deus reiterated his disinterest. It was not the princess he required, but the power and position of the royal family itself. He challenged the king's claim to the land, suggesting that the royal family too had once seized it from others. He demanded that the king relinquish the throne that had been enjoyed for decades. The king, Defiant, questioned whether the people, the Sanctus Maximus populace, would ever recognize Deus as their ruler. Deus, amused by the king's mention of the people's allegiance, unleashed a burst of demonic energy so powerful that it obliterated the castle. The sacred cross atop the church shattered, and a colossal explosion consumed everything in its vicinity. When the dust settled, all that remained were charred remains and a raging inferno. Deus, Turning to survey the destruction he had wrought, saw the kingdom he intended to claim now laid before him, silent and decimated. Deus cast a glance at the charred remains of the once formidable king, noting with a hint of mockery that the monarch lacked the fortitude even for a few more seconds of life. How boring, he mused, turning away from the smoldering carnage to address the heavens with a shout of disappointment. Hey God, I'm let down by these mortals, he declared his eyes fixating on a beam of light breaking through the clouds, half expecting the divine to answer his bold taunt. But no response came, and he mused on the long wait until a pure blood might rise to challenge him, pondering whether twenty more years would pass before he descended as usual. But his reverie was interrupted by the sound of anguished cries. Deus turned to discover the source, a young girl with golden locks arrayed in a luxurious white dress her sobs piercing the silence. It was the princess, the king's daughter, with eyes as blue as the ribbons that adorned her hair. She confronted the destructor of her world, demanding to know the identity of her family's runa. 
As Deus regarded her, he questioned her identity in turn, and the scene shifted, bringing forth the tale of the lowliest demons, and the first war that plunged into the depths of the demonic realm. The narrative followed the broken soul of a demon king as it descended a stairway into hell, to be encased in a new vessel. For a century, this new form was infused with potent magic and curses, until it was time for resurrection, thus birthing a new demon king, perpetuating the endless cycle. And then came the second war, a time when heroes seemed extinct, and the demons believed they could finally revel and revel in the lands of the living. In a surprising twist of fate, just as the demons began to revel in their apparent victory, another hero emerged, one imbued with the same divine powers as his predecessors. This hero, wielding an inconceivable amount of magical energy and brandishing abilities of the highest divine order, managed to battle his way through to the ultimate confrontation with the Demon King. Despite being riddled with arrows, his body on the brink of collapse, and his voice barely a whisper, the hero's spirit remained unyielding. The sheer determination in his eyes suggested a resilience that bordered on the supernatural, no deity needed to endorse his resolve. The Demon King, after countless resurrections, after initiating wars, spreading famine and sowing discord across the land, faced defeat once more. The cycle was relentless, the Demon King would fall, and a new one would rise from the ashes of the old, nurtured by a century of dark enchantments. And so it went. Time after time, a new hero would appear, each one more valiant than the last, clad in ever finer armor, shielded by an ever brighter aura of sacred light. They all shared the conviction that they could be the one to end the reign of the Demon King. But despite their efforts, the cycle persisted, a seemingly endless loop that unfolded over 6,580 years, with the story of the hero's triumph becoming an all too predictable cliche. In this era of complacency, where people believed a hero would always rise to save them, and the underworld held hope that perhaps this time would be the last, the narrative shifted focus to Deus. Encased within a crystalline prison, the demon worshippers chanted with fervor, calling forth their new king. They channeled all their energies into the crystal, seeking to resurrect the 666th demon king, Demiurgos. As the chants crescendoed, Demiurgos, the 666th, was reborn, his name echoing through the halls of the underworld as the latest in the line of Dark Sovereigns. Wearied by the incessant cycle and the farcical role he was expected to play, he penned a letter that would ripple through the demonic ranks with the force of a tempest. It read, I'm done with this demon king business. Don't look for me, you fools. Peace out. And with that, the 666th demon king signed off, leaving his minions wailing in disbelief. Transitioning back to the present, the aftermath of Demiurgos's wrath lay bare for all to see, the castle in ruins. It was then that the previous king's daughter, Princess April, approached the formidable Demiurgos, though her defiance seemed futile. She demanded to know the fate of her father, prompting Demiurgos to recall the king's warning to keep his hands off his prized daughter. The continent's pride, and the family's cherished bloom. Recognizing her as Princess April, and with the king now dead, Demiurgos contemplated the idea of taking her along to secure his ascent to the throne. Overcome with grief and vulnerability, April confronted him, but with a mere flick of his finger, Demiurgos cast a hollowing spell upon her. Her eyes grew vacant, her spirit subdued, and she kneeled obediently before him, proclaiming her body at his command. Demiurgos descended from his flight, lifted her chin to meet his gaze, and declared her his first human subject. April, now ensnared within his will, expressed her gratitude. As they drew nearer, Demiurgos peered into her soul, fully aware of his dominance and far from any notions of subservience. However, his attention shifted as he detected an intrusion upon this scene of conquest. He warned the hidden onlooker to reveal themselves or face a gruesome fate. In the shadows, a disturbance in the fabric of space appeared, where dark and violet magic swirled, and a voice chuckled, acknowledging the Lord's perceptiveness. As the portal widened, out stepped one of Demiurgos' own, a demon dressed in the height of infernal fashion. Removing his hat, 
the demon greeted his master, adding yet another layer to the unfolding narrative of power and dominion. The scene shifted as Demiurgos turned to face the newcomer, a demon who introduced himself with a subservient bow. Your loyal subject Alex greets you, my lord Deus, he said with a flourish. Deus, with a hint of irritation, accused Alex of shadowing him, to which Alex fervently replied, You're upsetting me, my lord. Wherever you go, I am always with you. Deus dismissed the sentiment as nonsense, accusing Alex of loyalty to his father rather than to himself. But Alex, bowing his head, professed his allegiance, claiming that Deus's lineage alone commanded his servitude. Deus, unconvinced, told Alex to leave, declaring his intent to never return to the demonic realm. Alex accepted this without protest, vowing to follow Deus's orders regardless. This surprised Deus, who had expected resistance. The conversation took a turn when Alex gestured towards the princess and suggested that Deus was about to plant his mighty seed. As he conjured a drink from thin air, Alex embarked on a dramatic monologue, nostalgically recalling his time by Deus's side throughout the 80 years of the demonic soul period. He spoke of his self-proclaimed sacrifices, claiming that he had breastfed Deus, transforming his own body to nourish him, offering guidance through an affectionate education. Deus, however, remembered a starkly different upbringing, one where Alex subjected him to harsh treatment, doling out beatings, and even casting him into the bloody confines of a torture chamber. As Alex wove his tale, embellishing his role as a nurturing figure, Deus interjected accusing Alex of being the very bastard who had thrust him into the Egg of Awakening, binding and imprisoning him. Despite Deus's accusations, Alex continued his sentimental narrative, reminiscing about Deus's childhood and expressing a dramatic sense of pride and emotion at his ward's growth and newfound interest in women. This display of emotion belied the harsh reality of Deus's upbringing and the twisted dynamic of their relationship. Deus, his patience fraying, commanded Alex to silence his theatrics and made it unequivocally clear that he had renounced his title as Demon King. From that day forth, he proclaimed he'd live as a mere mortal. Alex, ever the obsequious servant, agreed readily to his lord's declaration, prompting Deus to suspect hidden motives. Growing incensed, Deus unleashed his magic upon Alex, demanding to know the latter's true intentions. Alex, caught in the magical onslaught, could only laugh before confessing his curiosity about Deus's sudden attack on the kingdom. Deus admitted without pretense that there was no grand scheme behind his actions. He merely aspired to a kingly life in his newfound human existence. Alex, to Deus's astonishment, applauded the ambition, lauding Deus for seizing the largest kingdom, slaying its king, and claiming the princess upon his arrival on Earth, a feat he deemed devilishly fitting for a demon king. The praise, however, only served to nauseate Deus who felt mocked by the implications of his actions. Alex, seizing the moment, then unveiled his grand plan to take Deus's hypothetical son to the demonic realm, groom him as the next demon king, and ensure his descent to Earth 20 years hence to fulfill the destiny Deus himself had forsaken. This revelation left Deus dumbfounded, and as he processed the audacious plot, his gaze shifted to April. There she was, still and silent, a mere shell of a princess, unwittingly caught in the middle of a plot that spanned realms and generations. In a moment of clarity, Deus comprehended the full extent of the conspiracy he had nearly become entangled in. As he observed April's beauty, a realization struck him with comic timing. He had narrowly escaped fatherhood at the tender age of 80. He chuckled at the thought of such a close call, but his mirth was short-lived. Alex, ever the watchful servant, attempted to interject, only to be silenced by Deus's fierce command. With a roar, Deus unleashed a torrent of destructive energy that ripped through the castle and ravaged the town beyond. The power of the blast didn't stop there. It carved a path of ruin through distant mountains, showcasing the might of the Demon King. Alex watched in awe, struck by the raw strength of his master. It dawned on him that despite Deus not having reached his full potential, his power was immense. This realization sparked hope in Alex. Perhaps this 666th incarnation of the Demon King could finally turn the tides against the perennial hero. 
Deus, seizing upon the notion of standing out too much, concocted a cunning strategy. He would align himself with the hero, becoming an ally in the fight for justice. By doing so, he would ensure recognition for his efforts while cleverly remaining in the background, avoiding the spotlight that might reveal his true identity. With a sly grin, Deus outlined his plan to enjoy the fruits of victory without drawing undue attention to himself. You do the hard work, I get the glory, he declared, reveling in the simplicity and deceit of his scheme, and laughed with wild abandon at the prospect of such an ingenious subterfuge. Alex clutched desperately at the Demon King, his grip fueled by a deep concern. He argued that without a Demon King, there could be no hero, and the very concept of becoming the hero's ally was absurd. Please come to your senses, my lord, he implored. But Deus, unswayed and impatient, physically ousted Alex, declaring their next move was to seek out the hero. When Alex inquired about the fate of Princess April, Deus showed little concern instructing Alex to handle the matter himself. Alex puzzled, referenced her supposed importance, but Deus dismissed it as a mere ruse. The narrative then shifted, ascending to a higher plane where an enigmatic figure studied the unfolding events through an orb. This entity, observing Deus, Alex, and Princess April, mused on the apparent flaws of the 66th Demon King. Noting his lowly origins and questioning his intellect, the figure lamented the situation but expressed a singular interest in Deus's powers. Thanks for appearing at just the right time, the person spoke, hinting at an intention to usurp those powers. Sorry, but I'll be borrowing your strength for a while, they continued, confident in the assumption that Deus would eventually acquiesce, for in their view, all of existence served their grand design. This mysterious character, adorned in gold, with a golden chalice in hand, stood before a colossal golden dragon adorned with similar regal jewelry. On the road, Demiurgos began singing about finding the hero while mocking him as dumb and stupid. He then yawned, prompting Alex to question why they were using a carriage when they could simply fly. Demiurgos called Alex a dummy, questioning if he planned on publicly declaring he's a demon everywhere they go. Suddenly, Alex pointed at the destroyed castle, attributing its destruction to Demiurgos and remarking, a person worrying about such things turned a castle into a burning hell. Brushing it off, Alex asked if Demiurgos was really going to be the companion of a hero. Demiurgos affirmed, stating that it's okay to be a companion even without the blood, and expressing a desire for a simple life among the top 2% of wealthy people with a stand-in handling the monster slaying at the forefront. Alex doubted reaching the top 2% even as a hero's companion. Demiurgos assured him, mentioning the presence of the previous demon king and one of the greatest seven in the demon world, suggesting there was nothing to worry about. He believed the hero could easily dispatch a dragon with their help from the sideline. Alex, recalling Demiurgos's earlier desire to be human, questioned if he planned to use magic. Demiurgos responded, questioning why he wouldn't use the abilities he possessed, adding that's why they lost 665 times. He then brushed it off and asked if the hero had something like a ranking system. Alex replied, yes, they indeed have a ranking system. Demiurgos then inquired if it's similar to a rank and B rank, to which Alex responded, something like that. He explained that the first is a D rank dragon slayer, standing for one who can slay a dragon. Demiurgos asked if it's like a title one gets when killing a dragon, but Alex clarified that currently, dragons are neutral to both demons and humans. Dragons only attack villages in old stories, indicating their power to kill one. The next rank is G rank, a giant slayer capable of fighting giants. Following that is L rank, a lich slayer able to kill a lich. Demiurgos questioned why there are so many ranks, and if there are more. Alex stated, after that, they're just in alphabetical order. He added that the last rank is F rank, called failed products. If they were fruits, they'd be the fallen ones since they don't sell their ground up and made into jam. Demiurgos remarked that it must be sad, and Alex further explained that the higher your ranking is, the more support you can receive from nobles or obtain a position in the country. Not only would failures be neglected for support, but they're an unwanted rank that people hope would disappear. The human world is pretty cutthroat, Alex continued, 
emphasizing that there's something more critical than the hero ranking. That is blood. The closer one is to pure blood, the stronger they become. Yes, the first ones who saved the world, 66,580 years ago, the two saviors, the hero and the priestess, their children and their descendants, continuing the bloodline, the holy blood, blood. They measure how much of their blood is left in the families. The purer the blood, the stronger the aura they can use. The one with the purest blood became the hero, fighting the general and winning 665 times. Then taking the purity level of one's blood into account, whoever is closest to being a pure blood will have a higher hero rank. There are exceptions, but usually the purer the blood, the stronger you are. Demiorgos then inquires about the significance of this blood or pure blood concept. Alex explains that everyone takes it seriously, putting their life and pride on the line. In the end, the hero and the demon king will fight. People have been fighting for 60,000 years, all because of this one sentence. It was a promise. Demiorgos questions why they can't just live a simple life, like this carriage, slow and relaxing. Suddenly something catches his attention. He then gets up and points at a butterfly, asking Alex what this leafy thing flying around is. Since Demiurgos was stuck in an egg for 80 years due to the war, he remained ignorant of the world. Hen a butterfly landed on his finger, Alex informed Demiurgos of its identity. Suddenly a gust of wind caused the butterfly to flutter off Demiurgos' finger. Confused, Demiurgos asked Alex, What was that just now? The thing that flew by messing up my hair? Alex explained it was the wind. Demiurgos looked up at the sky and asked, What's that thing that's been floating above our head since earlier? The circular thing that makes my eyes hurt when I stare at it. Alex responded, That's the sun. Demiurgos continued, asking about a sweet scent that made his heart flutter. Alex explained, That's the scent of spring. Demiurgos then inquired about Alex's long life. Alex confirmed he was born after the first war in the demon world. Demiurgos suggested, he must have come up here once every hundred years. He expressed admiration for the surface, saying the previous demon kings probably never experienced such feelings. He reflected on his own fate, mentioning that if things had gone as planned, he would have been trapped for two more decades, destined to die at the hands of a hero he had never met. Grateful for escaping that fate, he declared that being a demon god is a job that should disappear. He asked Alex if he agreed. Alex looked at him in silence, and then Demiurgos brushed it off, saying that he's going to get some sleep, and asking Alex to wake him up when they arrive. He's saying this just in case, but if he takes him back to the demon world, they'll both die. Alex then sighed and answered, Yes, my lord. As their carriage navigated through the beautiful road, after a while the carriage stopped, and then Alex woke him up, telling him that they have arrived. Alex then informed him that this is the place Demiurgos described, a countryside village called Zorix, with little trade that isn't a militarized zone. Zorix, it's not that bad, Demiurgos said with a mourning face. As the carriage entered the village, Demiurgos asked about the heroes who live in this village to Alex. Alex answered that there are only two families here, an A-rank family that's close to being a G-rank, and a fallen family. Looks like there isn't a D-rank family. Demiurgos says, Alex answered that if there were a D rank at every castle, their demon army wouldn't even think of stepping foot on the surface. Demiurgos accuses the devil army of being cowardly in response to Alex's yes when asked if D ranks are so powerful. Demiurgos is abruptly drawn into a discussion. People were speculating as to whether or not they had heard that a dragon had assaulted Trier Castle. A man wonders how this could have happened, and warns that they shouldn't approach Trier Castle just yet because they haven't captured the dragon. According to another individual, he has also heard rumors that the castle was partially destroyed in a fire. Finally, a girl asks, how came dragons to be extinct so long ago? As she continues to worry about the topic, a man replies by saying that the old tales say that this is the time of the dragon's return, and if that's the case, it will be terrible. As Demiorgos gestures towards the humans, he reveals his belief that the dragons were apolitical. Yes, I shared that thought, Alex says, 
Something must have transpired in the 80 years since his previous surface appearance. The group persisted in their chat, voicing their worry that they shouldn't rush to inform the people of Sanctus Maximus and request the deployment of a D-rank hero. I can't believe they have no idea that our hero has already defeated the D-rank hero and wiped out the whole Sanctus Maximus population. They continued their search and eventually settled on this hotel as the best option in the area. Demiorgos then instructed Alex to begin addressing him as Master, rather than My Lord, going forward. They were greeted with a warm welcome to their golden pavilion by the receptionist. Without hesitation, Alex asked for a penthouse. Behind closed doors, the receptionist was fuming, asking herself, what's up with those things they're wearing? They're just some random country bumpkins, aren't they? He pretended to chuckle and said they must have traveled a long way to get to the penthouse, adding that it was a bit pricey. In an abrupt motion, Alex discarded a crate containing the riches they had plucked from Arcoma Castle. The man screamed at the staff, saying, Holy bitch! Upon seeing the sum of money, I thought you were supposed to accompany the client. The worker was in such a rush to accompany them that he lost his footing and fell. Zik Pan Holy Beach was the name the worker gave himself when he stood up to meet them. Before leading them to their apartment, he requested that they address him as Zik and seize their belongings. Zik said on the way up that the news about Triar Castle has made things a little rock. There was no need for alarm when a legendary dragon showed up. After all, their village was home to a famous A-rank family that was practically G-rank, so everyone could rest easy. They were welcomed to the penthouse, the crown jewel of their golden pavilion, as soon as they arrived at their door by him, who opened it. Since this was his first time supervising someone of such noble lineage, he was nervous about living up to their high standards. But he nevertheless told them he would try his best to meet their demands and encouraged them to contact him whenever they needed him. Once Demiorgos wanted to know if Zeke had the blood, he gave him a call. Zeke was about to reply when Demiorgos saw the discrepancy and made a joke about how, of the two hero families in Zorix, Zeke was probably associated with the fallen family. Demiorgos inquired about Zeke's blood purity level because he had speculations about Zeke's family having low purity for decades. Zeke, who was visibly embarrassed, identified himself as a failed product and confessed that he was just an F-rank. The room went up in flames in an instant, startling Zik but leaving the other two unfazed. The dragon had only just arrived in the settlement when it unleashed its wrath and destroyed everything in its path with its blazing wings. Panicked to death, Zik saw people fleeing for their life on the streets. Zik warned Demiorgos and Alex in an instant that they needed to get out of there fast. Surprisingly, Despite the danger, the two seemed unconcerned and were actually arguing. Demiorgos promised Zik that he would be Zik's ally and help him become a hero after the mayhem subsided. He said he had been looking for a hero and that this meeting seemed to be destined to happen. Zik was enticed by Demiorgos' offer, which promised him fame and fortune beyond his wildest dreams. Even though Zik had never touched a sword in his life, he threatened to remove the cursed, unsuccessful product title from Zik's name and asked if Zik wanted to spend the rest of his life as an F-rank. This was portrayed by Demiorgos as a chance that would never come again, which brought up memories of people dismissing F-ranks and calling them failures. In the face of this incredible opportunity, Zik knelt down and begged Demiorgos for help. He admitted he was an F-rank, but he promised Demiorgos he would make the most of his opportunity. Demiorgos, who was laughing, said that he was going to beg for Zik's soul anyhow, in response to his offer. Zik was to make his debut on this stage, according to Demiorgos, whose purpose it was to slay the dragon. Demiorgos put up his hand and proposed a five-condition contract. Zik, shocked, proposed something along the lines of goblins as an alternative. Party A was named Demiorgos, and Party B was named Zik Panholibice in the treaty. As a hero's sidekick, Party B would accompany Party A. When Party A3 gave the order, Party B would follow it to the letter. Only Party A has the power to end the contract, and the partnership could go on forever if Party A so chooses. Party A5 decided that Party B would get half of the glory and riches from their travels. The aforementioned parameters were met without any complaints from Party B. Their partnership was formalized by this contract, which laid out the conditions and responsibilities of each partner. 
Demiorgos gives him the contract and says to put his signature on it if he accepts it. After that, the deal is sealed. Zik hesitates for a second, but in the end he joyously shouts, Zik pan holibice, to accept the contract and live out his hero dreams. It is time for Zik to make his debut, Demiorgos says with a smile. Zik is to kill the dragon that he points out to him. You make a good point when you say that humans usually aren't very good at killing dragons. Demiorgos proposes a plan. They will take care of the dragon so Zik doesn't have to kill it. He lays out the strategy. Alex plans to face the dragon head on, vanquish it, and then set it down in Zik's path. Zik will pretend to defeat the descending dragon by swinging his sword at it while he stands in one spot. Concerned that people would be suspicious if an F-rank like Zik suddenly slayed a dragon, Alex raises concerns upon hearing the idea. He continues by saying that he can't possibly live in peace as a D-rank hero companion. Demiorgos looks at Zik with an unsettling expression on his face and then, out of the blue, rips his clothing off. Not content to rest on his laurels, he proceeds to seize a pot, puncture it twice with his laser eyes, set it atop Zik's head, and garb himself like a superhero with Zik's bellboy suit tied around his neck. These changes allow Zik to assume the identity of Potman, the masked hero, if a hero wants to be really anonymous. Demiorgos says they need to wear nothing but a cape and underwear. He thinks things might get even more interesting if a new unknown hero showed from out of nowhere. Following this, Alex offers to bring the dragon over, and Demiorgos just says, okay, to indicate his acceptance. After Alex leaves, Demiorgos looks to Zik and says they should go downstairs. Zik wonders aloud if they are truly going out in such manner, since he feels ashamed of his unconventional attire for a dragon combat. Demiorgos then points to a broom in the vicinity, kicks it at Zik, and claims it as his sacred weapon. Even though Zik is extremely embarrassed, Demiorgos tells him to hold the improvised sword, and promises that fame and money beyond his wildest dreams will come his way. Regardless matter how close the dragon gets, Zik felt something strange, but he couldn't put his finger on it. As if he could suddenly crush anything that crossed his path, he clamped down his fists. An intense yearning. Surely it was a result of Zik's genetic makeup. The heroic inclinations that had lain dormant in his hemoglobin. The hero's desire to slay the demon king in front of him is evident in his blood. But Zik probably thought this since he didn't know any better. Being famous and wealthy thrilled, bro. He is currently building up the confidence and belief that he can truly accomplish it. Zik responded with a simple, Yes, master, when Demiorgos suddenly summoned him. He was instructed, Go, my dog, by Demiorgos. Zik took off running while barked like a dog. Meanwhile, those on the outside were trying to stay alive in this shithole by covering themselves in fear and hoping for the best. As it soared above the village, the dragon unleashed a torrent of fire. Alex materialized from a sky portal that had suddenly materialized. From where he stood, he watched the hideous creature. All of a sudden, Alex rested a hand on his shoulder, drew off his coat, and exposed thirteen concealed hands. With his body prepared, he leaped at the dragon and landed on its neck. With an upward motion, he thrust his hands into the dragon's chest, intending to strike its heart. With the dragon's heart in his grasp, Alex spoke up, saying that the creature shouldn't fight him now that he had it. Then, he posed a question. What brought you here? The people and the dragons made a pact, didn't they? After taking a quick glance, Alex saw something purple, like a parasite, connected to the dragon's body. His eyes widened in shock. Clearly infested with that parasite, the dragon began to speak a language no one could decipher. Asking how a dragon of his ilk could understand such a vile language, Alex took a grave expression on his face. A faster flight was achieved when the dragon enhanced its speed. At the same time, Zeke stood on the lower ground, waiting. People who had taken cover in their homes began to wonder who he was and why he had come out of hiding all of a sudden. Concerned about his heroism, and whether he was attempting to face the dragon alone, they questioned him. After that, they noticed his clothing, which gave him a more villainous than heroic appearance. Zeke looked humiliated and felt weird inside as he heard those comments. At this point, shame and terror were entangled. Hey there, masked hero, keep it up, Demiorgos said from an adjacent seat. Go get Zorix for us. 
A wave of relief washed over the people as they began to believe, thanks to Demiorgos' remarks, that Zeke was a true hero. Zeke, who was holding his broom firmly, said that he could not afford to miss this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. All he could think about were fame and wealth. At the same time as it was snarling and spitting flames, the dragon persisted in flying carelessly through the air. Alex made the observation that it would be difficult to control. He felt helpless since things had reached this point. All of a sudden, his back began to move, and a plethora of hands sprung out from behind him. Hundred evil hands constricting poison was how he described this maneuver. The assault by Alex caused the dragon to squawk. Alex unleashed another scream from the dragon by using his remaining hand to perform a maneuver called heart piercing. All of a sudden, his focus is drawn to something. Alex is currently undergoing a parasite transfer from the dragon. It is purple in color. Prepare is the only word the dragon can muster. The one who was believed to be dead has definitely returned as I witnessed firsthand. This untruth. Similar to its last attempt to manipulate the dragon, the purple creature flings itself against Alex's face. It was this monster, Alex has learned, that unleashed the dragons on humanity out of nowhere. As this is happening, Demiurgos watches and wonders what Alex will do next. The crowd is waiting impatiently, so Demiurgos begs him to come down quickly. As he asks why it's taking so long to kill just one dragon, Demiurgos picks his nose and wears an expression of complete foolishness. The dragon's purple eyes drained of light as Alex shattered every bone in it with his hundred hands, and then it started growling. Now that it couldn't fly, the dragon fell fast. Demiurgos then summoned Zeke and told him to be prepared for the dragon was coming. Timing and a controlled swing, he said, are crucial. Zeke was reluctant to face death as the dragon drew near. Demiurgos assured Zeke with a chuckle that he had sworn to defend him with his own life on the line. Something in Zeke's blood started to glow when he heard this. With a firm grip on his broom, he reassured himself that he could handle the imminent test. As the parasite consumed him, Alex persisted in fighting for his life. Shortly after, the parasite took over his left side, changing his hands and sprouting eyes. Alex found himself in a precarious position as a conflict erupted between his regular and possessed hands. Alex drew on his talent out of the blue. He was able to detach numerous parasite pieces from his body with the help of a thousand glow whip and a hundred demonic hands. Sadly, a fragment stuck to his countenance. He reached for it and yanked desperately, trying to free himself. Demiurgos, concerned that their hero may be crushed, saw the dragon's descent speed and advised Alex to be careful. The spectators screeched in terror as the dragon closed in, and Alex fought desperately to get away. A few were getting ready to hide in the cellar. In the face of imminent peril, Zeke held firm. Standing up from his seat, Demiurgos yelled out Alex's name, challenging his behavior and suggesting that he take it easy. Zeke, on the other hand, maintained his unwavering resolve and refused to budge. With a single blow, he will vanquish the dragon, he swore. An ancient family secret known as Moonlight Glow was revealed in a short flashback in which Zeke's father warned him to be cautious and shared the skill with him. The father emphasized the importance of Zeke mastering this method in order to ward off any possible invasion by the army of the Demon King. Because of the country's limits, Zeke's neighbors doubted that he could take part in the Demon King's subjugation, which worried young Zeke. Assuring him that Zeke would surely become a heroic figure in the struggle against the Demon King, his father emphasized his family's holy ancestry. Accordingly, he ought to do adequately in his studies. Zeke says, All right, Dad, while smiling. In the here and now, Zeke leaned back, raised his broom, and readied himself to unleash his moonlight glow attack. In the meanwhile, Alex removed the parasite from his face, while Demiurgos exploded the dragon's flesh with a talent called Doom's Guillotine. Zeke persisted in his assault using the Demon King's Splitter, slashing down until the dragon's torso exploded and blood spurted out in all directions. Zeke let out a startled scream while keeping his eyes shut. When he opened them, he beheld the landscape stained with the dragon's blood. He peered through them and saw the dragon's blood all over the place. His focus turned to the jubilant crowd, who were praising him for vanquishing the dragon. They claimed he was a divinely sent hero. Demiurgos pretended to clear his throat to get Zeke's attention as he blushed from the compliments. Masked hero, shouldn't you change into your disguise and hide? Demiurgos questioned. 
Zeke responded. Ah, absolutely. His face contorted with shame. In an effort to gather clothing, he began to flee. As the parasite's purple marks appeared, Alex stood silently atop the chapel. The dragon's voice proclaimed, The one who was considered to be dead has returned, as he gazed downward at it. Demiurgo stretched his hands the moment he awoke the following day after a restful snooze. Out of nowhere, Alex walked in with a drink and told Demiurgos that most people drink coffee first thing in the morning. Zeke walked into the room at that very moment, sounding the alarm. As he smiled and blushed, he said that the entire town had been looking for the disguised hero who they saw as their savior. Demiurgos noticed the filthiness of Zeke's clothing and asked him about it. With a smile on his face, Zeke stated that he had been helping clean up the town after yesterday's catastrophe left it in ruins. Well, it's all right, Demiurgos said, taking into account the high wages associated with physical labor. The course of events is precisely as I had anticipated. With a wink, he conveyed his delight at waking up to the sun's rays and sipping his coffee in the morning light. Demiurgos remarked on how pleasant mornings are on the surface, and Alex disclosed that the coffee was brewed using the tongue and left eyeball of a dragon. Demiurgos was pleased with the flavor. The villagers, meanwhile, were hard at work fixing the damage that the dragon had done the night before. Some people gripe about how heavy items are, while others advise them to just get moving, unless they want to spend the night doing this. In order to encourage the guys to eat before working hard, the wives and children arrive bearing food. Zeke is likewise hard at work, pulling rocks while an obese guy gives him orders. Demiurgos, who is sitting nearby, remarks that they're putting in a lot of effort to attempt to restore this uninspiring community. He takes note of Zeke's diligent efforts as well. Alex nods in agreement and continues by saying that he mentioned his history of odd jobs to Zeke yesterday during their conversation. Due to financial constraints, his family had to work hard to raise a hero. He helped out around the house by performing chores like laundry, cleaning, lumbering, and grave digging. It would be more efficient to just list everything he has done so far. Demiurgos proceeds to state that he has made a decision. Since they have discovered a hero and traveling is a pain, he says they will just begin in this town. It's nothing special, yet he finds pleasure in it in some way. He claims it marks the beginning of the human deus. Shall we get going? He exclaims, jumping to his feet. Let Zeke get to work. Where to? Alex wonders. Of course it's to go sell off the dragon leather, Demiurgo says, his smile persisting. Since it is used on equipment, doesn't dragon leather cost a pretty penny? I thought we were aiming to be among the wealthiest 2% of the population, weren't we? Alex informs him, much to his surprise, that last night the Heroes Bureau stole it all. Furious, Alex rants about how regular people can't handle dragon remains because they're too powerful. As Demiurgos says, fuck, and then we just went ahead and killed it. Alex asks anxiously where they're going after he says, we're going, in a frightening voice. Demiurgos shocked Alex by saying they will destroy the Heroes Bureau. Telling him that the Heroes Bureau is their main base, he tells him to calm down. Alex thinks it's insane for Demiurgos to do it alone against the Heroes, no matter how strong he is. He stresses the danger. The consequences for the Heroes could be severe if they learn that the Demon King is not in his Demon Realm. After Demiurgos mentions his prior statement about becoming a hero sidekick, Alex brings it up again. In a casual tone, Demiurgos asks, So? It is necessary to register with the Heroes Bureau in order to become a hero in the human sphere, as Alex points out. Who would recognize Zeke as a hero if the Heroes Bureau vanished? As Demiurgos ponders this, Alex begins to question whether he has managed to prevent the demon race's annihilation. Demiurgos offers the suggestion of recovering damages from the adjacent country. A brilliant thought. I thought you were Deus the Human now, not Demiurgos the Demon King, Alex says in confusion, his voice betraying his disbelief at the decision. Demiurgos is adamant that the next day they would move forward. Demiurgos is unmoved by Alex's suggestion that they travel back to the demon world. On the next day, they ride in a carriage as they take in the picturesque vista. Alex tries to talk to Demiurgos, but he doesn't hear back. As his anger builds, he yells out Demiurgos' name until someone answers. 
After enjoying life on Earth for so long, Alex proposes a return to the underworld. Everything in the demon realm is waiting for his return, he claims. He says that the doomed day will come in 20 years, and that they must not squander time in the meanwhile. In order to conquer the world, he tells him to quickly become an expert in the technique of the Demon King. Without showing any emotion, Demiurgos says, That's your problem. They want him to comply, but he doesn't see any reason to do so. He predicts the arrival of a demonic king who will launch an assault on the human realm. Demiurgos, the entire demon realm, and the humans who are about to be attacked all accept this apparently clear action as if it were breathing. As a counter-argument, Demiurgos asks whether God is necessary if everything works out the way planned. He tells him to think about how a demon king isn't present and that it's a worthwhile experience. It makes no difference who the girl is, Alex exclaims abruptly, interjecting. You should have a son or daughter to take over from the 666 demon king, right? Demiurgos shoots back. What, any girl? In this day and age, how could you possibly use such language? Your demonic nature would be undeniable. You devil, get the hell out of here. Unfazed, Alex dismisses him, maintaining his stance that he will remain until Demiurgos names a successor for the underworld. Given his current behavior, Demiurgos thinks he should live here indefinitely as his servant. Alex suggests that he look for a wife, a woman who would compliment him well. If the subject of marriage comes up again, Demiurgos threatens to destroy the demon world himself, he said. Following that exchange, they walked silently through this breathtaking area, covered with beautiful flowers. But does that even work? Demiurgos suddenly asked, breaking the silence. Gazing at him, Alex inquired, What are you referring to? Does that princess from before even work? Demiurgos nervously said. Alex, perplexed, dared to inquire, The princess? Demiurgos timidly proceeded, You know, Essex. His face contorted with embarrassment and anxiety. Curiosity peaked, Alex asked, Essex. Embarrassing himself, Demiurgos stood up abruptly to clarify that he was inquiring whether demons can impregnate humans. Unaware of Demiurgos' true motive, Alex insisted that demonic and human mating rituals are identical. In most cases, he said, a man's testicles will release sperm before he ejaculates. A kid is born 3742 weeks after a sperm cell enters the uterus and penetrates the egg. Demiurgos suggested foregoing sex education after hearing these remarks in one ear and them leaving the other. Furthermore, Alex verified that Demiurgos possessed the ability to instantly transfer his demonic sperm into another person's body if he so desired. The success percentage of getting pregnant by direct sexual contact was 99.999%, while the success rate through a passionate kiss was 50%. There is a 25% probability that a girl can be impregnated by his peck as well. The idea that Demiurgos's peck can cause a pregnancy surprises him. When Demiurgos hears from Alex that he may get pregnant just by shaking hands with a woman, he is taken aback and begins to wonder if his body was made for reproduction alone. He becomes angry and yells out a curse word, claiming that the purpose of this body is very clear, to kill and procreate. He becomes more and more unhappy with what he learns. According to Alex, God gave them this blessed body as a sign of hope and salvation for their demon realm. Blessed my arse, Demiurgos says with a hint of sarcasm. Being little more than a printed part every hundred years makes him uneasy, he says. He feels uneasy about being held to high standards and questions the relevance of his thoughts in this context. They were both taken aback when they heard a girl's cries for help as she desperately tried to escape from a group of frightening looking individuals. The girl was being pursued by mountain bandits and she begged them to save her. And then Alex said, it's a lovely woman in trouble. And he summoned Demiurgos to her aid. This prompted Demiurgos to ask why he should. Alex said that positive things could happen at any moment. Do you not see something fishy about this? Demiurgos asked. Alex inquired about its nature, perplexed. Demiurgos provided an account of her rapid dash to them, pleading for assistance. The scenario in which the beautiful person begs for assistance while being pursued is the most cliched trope in fantasy literature, Alex shot back. Then what exactly is the issue? Demiurgos noted that there is nothing obstructing the views in their vicinity, 
So the question becomes, from where did they emerge? Continuing, he asked, Do you really believe they wouldn't notice us the whole time they're after her? The forest is far away, even if you can see it. I didn't see them, and neither did you. He was questioned by Demiurgos as to whether he had orchestrated this ill-planned scheme. Demiurgos explained his reasoning to Alex by saying, Using that female to make me bear an heir. With a sigh, Alex asked himself what sort of person he thought he was. Claiming to be Alex, the Demon Realm's top strategist, he warned that such a terrible notion would not be allowed to pass. Sir Hero, I'm being chased by mountain bandits. Please help! The girl cried out as she rushed up to the wagon. Demiurgos made it clear that he was only a friend to the hero. Please, Sir Hero's friend, assist me, she pleaded as her tears streamed down her face. I am being pursued by the mountain bandits. Demiurgos told her that their group was too powerful to deal with mundane tasks like battling mountain robbers because they were a high-level dragon hunting party. The girl's frustration was palpable as she whispered, Ah, fuck! What gives you the willies? In an angry gesticulation, Demiurgos asked if she had just cursed. Crying and denying it, she asked, What? What on earth? Yes, the sidekick of Sir Hero. Assist this frail young damsel, please. The sudden impact of an axe on the wagon caught Demiurgos's attention. There was a mocking laugh followed by the words, Hey, little kids! While mocking Demiurgos's pale visage, the mountain bandits told him to go lost with that crummy chariot or face certain death. They were asked by another robber whether they were from another planet or anything because of their strange clothing. Demiurgos swore, Burn for eternity! as he glared at the axe wielder responsible for the carriage's destruction. The man's pals were frantically trying to extinguish the fire when all of a sudden he began to writhe in agony, engulfed in a blaze of purple flames. When Demiurgos informed them that the fire was uncontrollable, they were all taken aback. No matter who they were or what magic they employed, he told them, the fire would never go out and the individual would remain burning until the world ended. Inviting others to join him in eternal fire, he then questioned who would be the next. The robbers didn't dally. They snatched Demiurgos, their blazing buddy, and bolted for safety. Upon their departure, the girl beamed at Demiurgos. He advised her to go on an adventure now that the bandits had left, but she begged him to wait. And then she told him that mountain bandits had captured their temple. The sacred artifact was taken from them and all the priestesses were become slaves. She implored him to save their temple and free them from the clutches of the mountain bandits. Demiurgos frowned and said he would rather not take on such a simple mission, picking his nose in the process. Frustrated, the girl clutched the carriage so tightly that it cracked slightly. Regardless, Demiurgos insisted that they leave immediately, and Alex responded with a simple, yes, master. Out of the blue, she orders them to hold on and mentions that she overheard Demiurgos bring up dragons before. She wonders if he is with a hero who's wearing nothing but his undies. According to her, the actual gold dragon, the deity of dragons, has his temple at the pinnacle of the dragons. He will be rewarded with the actual gold dragon's helmet if he helps drive away the mountain bandits. Demiurgos hears that and chooses to grant her wish. Just a few moments after that, up the stairs may be made out. While Demiurgos remained on his back, Alex, who is presently heaving and puffing, possesses these steps. In response to Alex's question about why they don't simply fly over, Demiurgos says, Come on, how can we fly? I am not the Demon King, after all. His back seems like it's going to crack, so Alex proposes he give him a true piggyback ride instead of simply standing on it. Alex, perspiring profusely, views the scenario with suspicion. He notes that the girl, who has a human body, has been running non-stop for 30 minutes on such a steep mountain. Demiurgos continues by saying it makes no difference who she is. He has no idea what she's planning, but he would sever her head if she tells a lie, no matter how small. Did the dragons worship a deity? The god of dragons, the actual dragon? Demiurgos asks. In response, Alex says no, drawing parallels to the adoration he receives from demons. There is only one dragon who truly reigns supreme, and that is the genuine gold dragon. According to him, there is only one deity in the universe, and that God is the one responsible for creating everything in it, including people, dragons, and demons. 
So, isn't God exclusively looking out for humans? Demiurgos asks as he surveys the heavens. According to him, the dragons and demons are merely supporting cast members. After that, Alex reassures him not to be skeptical, saying that God is perfect love and the sole source of truth. With God's favor, they will be favored if they can conquer Horson. Demiurgos looks up and remarks, that's one unusual way to demonstrate affection. Demiurgos climbs on top of an exhausted Alex as he collapses to the ground at the peak of the mountain, accusing him of being weak. On the way down, he adds, he will also depend on him. Once Demiurgos reaches the cave, he summons the girl and inquires about the whereabouts of the mountain bandits and the helmet of the real gold dragon. In a kind manner, he requests that she relinquish it. Something isn't right, Alex says, so he should be careful. All of a sudden, the cave door shuts and they're alone in the dark until they hear giggles. The previous girl reverts to her normal shape and congratulates them on their achievement. Huh, Demiurgos responds. It appears that you were the thief from the mountains who stormed the temple. Where does the helmet fit? The girl confronts him, demanding an explanation for his continued indifference to the gravity of the situation. She then identifies herself as Laura, the deity of dragons, and commands everyone to bow down to her. The one who governs all dragons, who is also their mother, the Golden Law, the one and only golden dragon, the genuine gold dragon. After Demiurgos asked what was going on, Alex clarified that they had gotten themselves into a major jam. It was beyond their humble expectations, so Laura began to giggle and inquired whether they were astonished. To show that she was not easily irritated, she advised them to beg if they were scared. Demiurgos placed his palm on his chin and muttered, Right, that is quite remarkable, Laura, the deity of dragons. She inquired if he had finally grasped the meaning of his remarks, as she giggled. In that case, she would probably ask him to do something kind for her as a gesture of contrition. As if completely bewildered, Demiurgos spoke the words, Huh? To what do you refer? Something about dragon lore or dragon mother lore? What I mean is that I would also enjoy a good title like that. When he presented himself, he always felt like something was missing, he said. Watching over everything from the world's shadows, the top 2% of deep dark alpha males. He wanted to identify himself in this way to set himself apart. Alex clapped his hands and responded, Oh, as anticipated of my lord, in response to his question regarding Alex's thoughts on the matter, their lack of knowledge infuriated Laura, who screamed at them to shut up and stopped being so ignorant. After asking, don't you have something to apologize for? She pushed them to quickly apologize and ask for forgiveness. Demiurgo stated that he didn't believe he had done anything to initiate contact with her and proceeded to inquire as to her motivations. Remember yesterday when you slayed a dragon? She asked, gesturing toward him. She made it clear that he had murdered one of her dragon offspring and that she is the dragon family matriarch. Demiurgos then asked if she is causing such a ruckus just because of that. Suddenly, she got up and dashed towards him. Her face was near his, and she repeated his words, just because of that. She said that he must have a death wish or something. Suddenly, a burst of flame surrounded them, as she declared that this place is the Golden Jade Realm. Even if he is the Demon King, he stands no chance against her in this place. Alex was shocked and told Demiurgos that this place is the territory of the Golden Dragon, they are inside her domain. Fighting her here is dangerous. Laura started laughing and then commended Alex for his knowledge. She told Demiurgos to hurry up and kneel before her. To her bewilderment, Demiurgos asked her if she is doing this despite knowing who he is. With a menacing tone, he said that if she is the true golden dragon, he can just take her face to use. He told her to prepare her face, since he will be ripping her skin off her face. After hearing those words, she burst into anger, her eye veins turning red as she exclaimed, You dare! So this ends today's chapter. Check out other series if you haven't, but other than that, until next time.